morning. We're about to start. Thanks for listening to the first edition finale of Schubert's Hello Trio in E flat, Porsche 923 Centinaia, played by the Vienna Piano Trio. <sighs> we've timed ourselves 36 minutes past 8. It's time to say good morning to film critic Howard Elias. Good morning. Good morning. We're live again. Yes, you've been away. Yeah. Uh, and on your travels, you were able to uh, see some films up in the air. <laughs> yeah, I think them. I'd have nothing better to do. <laughs> You're going to right. tell us about <laughs> Yeah, I saw. Yeah, typically, you know, you get on an airplane, long haul flight. What do you do? You watch something on the, on the screen. So actually, I saw I saw quite a few movies, and but one really stood out. It was called Bombshell, the Hedy Lamarr story, and it played at the Hong Kong International Film Festival. But I didn't get to see it. I tried, and I think it was sold out. Which I was like, why would why would it be sold out? But it was a good film, and I think people should try to get to see it. I don't know that it's going to come here commercially. Um, but I'm sure it's available on subscription services. So it's called Bombshell, the Hedy Lamar story. Now, when I mentioned to you that I was going to talk about this film, you didn't remember, you didn't know who Hedy Lamar was, right? No, I knew she was an actress. Oh, okay. You knew, you knew the name, but you didn't no, know. I didn't remember her face. Ah, okay. Well, I'll tell you something. My experience with Hedy Lamar goes back to childhood. I don't know why. I must have seen the film Samson and Delilah, which she played Delilah. Oh, I'm sure I have too. Yeah. I mean, how many years have we it's, Well, I'm looking at an internet movie database, 1949. I did not see it in 1949, but I must have seen it on TV. But my experience with her is my mother... When, it must have been before she was married, she must have been about 18, 19 years old. She went to a photography studio and had, you know, one of these headshots done. And it was done in the style of Hedy Lamar. At least I thought so. As a kid, I thought so. And I used to say to her, Mom, you look just like Hedy Lamar." Now, what I didn't know until I saw this movie was that was a huge compliment. My mother, of course, never gave a, never showed her appreciation for anything. Sorry, Mom. I don't know if you're listening, but anyhow. Um... But Hedy Lamarr, back in the 1940s, was considered, and I think even today she was considered to be the most, the, the most beautiful woman to ever appear on film. Now, you don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> but she was, she was a style setter. And, so, and, and her, her style, if you've never seen what she looked, she had dark hair, very sultry, smoky eyes, not like Sarah Huckabee Saunders, smoky, but beautiful smoky. <laughs> And and a very definite part down the middle of her head, you know, a part with 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 curls, shoulder length hair. And my mother's photo was exactly in that style. So I think you know now in retrospect, I think my mother was trying to emulate Hedy Lamarr, though she would never admit to it. But somehow I always said that she looked like Hedy Lamarr. Now, interestingly, what I learned from this film, and you know, if you go on Wikipedia, you can read about it. Hedy Lamarr was more than just a pretty face. And she was a brain. She was a brain. And she invented something called frequency jumping, which forms the basis of Wi-Fi encrypted communications today, which is absolutely amazing. She invented it in the 1940s along with a composer. What was the composer's name? George? George Anthau. George Anthau. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, she had the idea and somehow... I guess she knew him from Hollywood, and, and the two of them together collaborated and came up with this idea. But and, they also said that it may have been something that she actually saw that her husband had invented back in Austria. He was working in some kind of like engineering, engineering. situation, and, and she was asked by the U.S. government to create this for the Navy. Well, no. Well, look, the movie says it's not, not that way. So, you know, look, who knows, right? Yeah, the movie, the, according to the movie, she invented it. And, and, and according to the story, she was always a very curious child. And she was always taking stuff apart and putting it together. This was her style. And and certainly from, from sketchbooks, according to the movie again, she, you know, this was, this was what she did. That she was always thinking about things, how they work. And the problem that the U.S. Navy had in the early days of World War II is they, they, the, the, the boats, the warships, would communicate with the missiles by radio frequency. Maybe they do that today. I don't know. And on one frequency. And they would, they would you know, fire the missile at the German 
U-boats, and the Germans would jam that frequency, and the missile would just probably sink, I guess, at that point. In any case, the missile would be would be errant. And so her technology, this this frequency jumping technology, meant that the boat and the missile would communicate on multi on multiple frequencies that would that would vary, and the Germans weren't able to jam it. And so what happened very interestingly in the movie, you, you learn about this, the 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 she she gave the the patent, or she not just gave the patent, she gave the idea. She held on, she and George held on to the patent, but she gave the idea to the Navy, to the to the military, and they shelved it. And secretly working on it, of course, right? <laughs> but they said to her, according to the movie again, they said to her, we'd rather have you, if you want to do something for the war effort, we'd rather have you raise war bonds. And she raised millions of dollars in war bonds. I mean, she did it. It wasn't like she was a slouch. She did it. So, and it wasn't until much long after the war that she found out that the Navy had used her invention. But by the time she she claimed her her rights for it, the patent had already expired, and apparently you're allowed six years after the patent expires to claim to claim ownership. But she it was even after the six years, so she ended up getting nothing for this, and it's estimated now that that patent is worth thirty billion dollars. <laughs> so very interesting story. She's a very tragic figure. Um, she she died just in uh, 2000 at age 85 but like most hollywood stars and she started look she was huge she started with clark gable spencer tracy you know all the big stars of the day victor mature but like most of the stars or the female stars back in those days this the studios fed her a steady diet of barbiturates and sleeping pills to get her up in the day and get her to sleep at night same thing with judy garland and she became addicted to to these drugs, and um, and also she became addicted to plastic surgery, and she ended up looking a lot like Michael Jackson at the end. I mean, she was just carved to pieces in the end. So she had very and multiple marriages. You know, none none of her marriages lasted. What her like six, I think, six or seven? I can't remember. Yeah, and her eldest child was adopted, and she basically abandoned the child. Because the child, it was the kid was like a problem child, and she couldn't deal with it or didn't want to deal with him, and abandoned him. And uh, he's a, he figures in this movie as well. And both her, her, her natural-born children are also in the movie. Um, so very interesting. So that's called Hedy Lamar. It's called Bombshell, Bombshell, the Hedy Lamar story. So if you're on an airplane, check it out. Or, you know, if you have a and subscription. Bombshell with two meanings. That's right. Exactly. Well, yeah, exactly. That's bombshell it. meaning, oh, she's so gorgeous, Bombshell, you know, and the Bombshell with the... Exactly. So yeah. that's it. So highly recommended. I mean, as far as documentaries go, it's it's standard, you know, talking heads, as they say. Um, but I thought it was a good story and one that we not too many people know about. Certainly I didn't know about, so... Check it out. Anyhow, let's talk about the big film that opened yesterday. You know, most films in Hong Kong open on Thursdays, but the Ant-Man Ant -Man and the Wasp opened yesterday. Do you know why? Mm -mm. Well, yesterday was, July, yesterday was July the 4th, <laughs> right? I think they got it wrong here in Hong Kong. I think they thought it was going to open in America on July the 4th, but it's opening tomorrow in America. Or remember we're ahead. So it, no, it doesn't it matter. In July, on July 4th in America. But yeah, but July 4th already... in America is July 3rd here. No. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're 12 hours ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So we're, so they're a day behind, or half a day half behind. Half a day behind. Half a day behind. So if it opens but if it opens here on the 4th, it's... It would have opened... No, the other way around. Mm. Right? <laughs> I don't know. Well, in we any case, we had it first. We were one of the first places to have it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> it's so, too early in the morning. It's too early in the morning. Yeah. So we are one of the first. So, um, so you know, check it out. If you want to see it before your friends and fr family in uh, America, go see it today. So it opened, it opened yesterday. I happened to see it yesterday. And if you're one of these Marvel fanboy or fangirl, as many of the people in the audience, in my audience yesterday were, they all came with their Marvel t-shirts on. 
um, you were probably wondering where Ant-Man was during Avengers Infinity War. He wasn't there. And everybody, you know, all the, you know there's tons of articles, or there have been tons of articles uh, written over the past few months going, where was Ant-Man? Where was, where was Ant-Man? Well, when you see this movie, you will find the, out the answer to that question and a whole lot more. So now, very briefly, because I don't want to spoil it for anybody, but I'll just tell you, just set it up for you. It's now two years since the events of Captain America Civil War, and former petty criminal Scott Lang, who's Ant-Man, played by the wonderful Paul Rudd, he's been under house arrest for much of that time. So that's why he wasn't in Avengers Infinity War. He was under house arrest. But he's been making most of his time... Uh, bonding with his young daughter, Cassie, and practicing on his electric drum set to the sounds of the Partridge family's Come On, Get Happy. Do you remember that song? Yes, I do. Can I sing it? Yeah, go on. Hello, world, hear us, hear the song that we're singing. Come on, get happy. <laughs> right? <laughs> God, I used to watch that show. Yeah. Okay, go on. Yeah. Strangely, though, it's not on the film film's official soundtrack, but it is in the movie. So one day, Scott has a strange dream where he's back in the quantum realm. Now, if you know, if you watch the first Ant-Man film, you know what the quantum realm is. And if you didn't watch the first Ant-Man film, you'll figure it out very quickly. And he sees Dr. Hank Pym's wife. Now, Dr. Hank Pym is played by Michael Douglas. And his wife, Janet, who's the original Wasp, she's played by Michelle Pfeiffer. And so he sees uh, Janet... And she's trapped in the quantum realm. She's been there for 30 years after she disabled a missile that would have killed millions of people. So Scott reaches out to Dr. Pym and his daughter Hope, who's the new wasp, and she's played by Canadian, yay, Evangeline Lilly, who was on TV's Lost. And he tells them about his dream, and they interpret it that Janet is still alive, and she's trying to contact them through Scott. Now, fortunately, over the past two years, uh, Dr. Pym and Hope have been very busy building a device to enter the quantum realm safely, and they just need one last piece of technology, which Hope tries to purchase from black marketeer Sonny Birch, played by Walton Goggins, who seems to be making a career out of playing bad guys. And Sonny, however, wants in on the action, as does a mysterious villain called Ghost, or she's dubbed Ghost, played by Hannah John Kamen. I think she's British. She was in Game of Thrones. And Ghost has the ability to pass through objects, which, and she needs Pym's technology to save her own life. She's, she's got this condition that causes her to pass through objects, but it's also killing her. So she wants that technology as well. So this, her, their encounter sets off a chase and a race against time between Ant-Man and the Wasp and Dr. Dr. Pym on one side, and you have uh, Sonny Birch on another side, and you have Ghost on another side, and then you have FBI agent Jimmy Woo, played by the wonderful Randall Park, and you have Scott's uh, work colleagues, led by his motormouth pal from prison, Luis, played by Michael Pena. So you have five groups all jockeying for position to try to... to some are the good guys and some are the bad guys. But even in this movie, the bad guys aren't so bad. But that's, that's, that's a shortcoming with the film, that the bad guys aren't so bad. So that's basically what the film's about. So leaving aside for half a second that this is a Marvel film, Ant-Man and the Wasp is a thoroughly enjoyable sci-fi caper. I liked it. I not It was not the best Marvel film out there, but certainly one of the best, in my opinion. It's fun. It's funny. It doesn't take itself too seriously. And it's a welcome relief after Avengers Infinity War, which I thought was, it had a very bleak ending, and it was bloated. I mean, it was, you know, everybody was in it. Everybody and their mother was in it, you know. <laughs> and interesting, you know, Marvel films, I always complain, Marvel films are always two hours and 30 minutes long. This one is just short of two hours, so it was a nice length, you know. <laughs> so, so I really appreciate this. There are wonderful performances here, starting with Rudd, who was also one of the film's four writers, and, um, you know, as we've all known since we since we used to watch, uh, since the days of TV's Friends, where Paul Rudd was Phoebe Buffay's boyfriend. Do you remember that? 
Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he was the boyfriend. I think they got married in the last episode, right? Or the second last episode or something. I think they got married. Um, he is tremendously talented, and he has wonderful comic timing, impeccable comic timing. There's there's wonderful clips on YouTube of, of him uh, doing... He does Jimmy Fallon does this thing, uh, karaoke thing or something. Not uh, not James Corden, who does the carpool, but Jimmy Fallon also does. He is he is so talented, this guy, and he's great because he does he does the funny parts really well, and he does the sensitive parts really well. So I I just I think he's really just a a, a tremendous actor. But there's one scene in particular where his character channels Janet Michelle Pfeiffer's character, and he does a wonderful impression of her, but at the same time. He knows who he is. Everybody else knows who he is, but but he's imitating a woman, right? And it's very, very well done. Um, I think the other one who's really superb is is Michael Pena, and I think this might be his best performance to date. I'd say if if Rudd weren't so good, he would have Michael Pena would have stolen the film because that's to me that's how good the two of them really are. Uh, there's a scene involving the truth a truth serum. And I'm not going to say anything more, but it's involving a truth serum. To me, that's the film's highlight. That with, with Michael Pena just just natters on and on and on and on, just just sort of spilling his guts about the truth, and it's hysterical. He also has some wonderful uh, one-liners, including one involving a candy dispenser that will will most certainly find its way into the vernacular in the next few days. I'm sure you're going to hear people using this word that he says in the movie. Now, of course, it wouldn't be a Marvel film without plenty of CGI, and this doesn't, it doesn't disappoint here as well, but it's good CGI, it's not bad CGI. There's flashback scenes showing a younger Michael Douglas, Michelle Pfeiffer, and Lawrence Fishburne, who's also, he plays uh, Pim's ex-colleague, Dr. Foster. They're, you know, they're, they're supposed to, you know, take place like 30, 35, 40 years ago. The technology is amazing. You think, you know, it's called, what do they call it, age-reducing technology or something? It's like Photoshop for movies. I mean, there's, there's not a wrinkle, there's not a... And it's, 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 it's fabulous, you know, it's, it, it looks so real. You know, in the old days, they would put makeup on, and, yeah, yeah. you know, Absolutely. this is all done with computers now. So it's really <laughs> just beyond, beyond impressive. And also, as it's a Marvel film, there are two post credit scenes at the end, so stay right to the very end. That's right. Stay right to the very end. Both of these set up Ant-Man's participation in next year's Avengers sequel, so he will most certainly be, well, I don't know, because I haven't read the script, but I think there's a very good chance that he will be. So, I would say this is a great film for the summer. You know, it's not, I think, uh, Thor Ragnarok is a better film, or Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 1 is a better film. This is a really good, fun film. So go see it. Ant-Man and the Wasp. Thank you. Have a good one. Thanks.